Oh, here it comes. Hi, uh, hey there. So we'll start out here before we all enter. So maybe the best thing to do would be for everybody to be down here, and then we can talk and look around, and then I can, I can then we can come up to the house. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Have a right here. Welcome to the Morrisville Mansion. Hello, everyone. Hello, dear. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Camilla. Hey, Camilla. And I'm going to be your tour guide today. So um, I'm going to talk first a little bit about where we are on the island and a little bit about the house from the outside. And then we'll go inside and we'll get to see everything throughout the house. So. Um, let me tell you a, a little bit about where you're standing. Now, I don't know if you want to just take a quick, just look around, not walking, but just with your eyes, look around and see where we are, like uh, geographically speaking, like what kind of a place is this? Like, are we low down? Are we high up? Are we near water? Are we not near water? What are you seeing? Yes. Well, well, when I'm here, I thought, I thought, I thought I walked in a baby park. Yes, uh-huh, it is kind of a baby park. It's a little bit of a park, a small park. This is only a small part of a really, really big, not even a park, it was just the land was really, really big here. The person who built this house had 136 acres of land. So everything here that you see outside of this house was not here when they built this house. They built this house in 1765, and as you might have noticed, it's not low down, right? It's on the top of a hill. Yes. Want to add to that? Yes. Uh, It was years, years ago, maybe 200, 300 years ago, my father explained to me all New York City was all farms. Now I have this ugly job in the Wall Street, and that was four farms. Then the government, and that was a farm too. That's, you're 100% right. That's exactly right. So all of this was farmland. That's exactly right. And you could see from this hill all the way down to where um, Wall Street is and all the way down there because there were no buildings. There was nothing, no buildings. Um, but <clears throat> there was a river down here and there was a river that way. So can, does anybody know what, what the rivers around here are called? Any names of the rivers? Yes. Harlem and Hudson. Perfect, exactly. So this is the Harlem River and that's the Hudson River. And so you could see boats coming in, you could see anybody approaching. There was a road coming up on the side here, they, they called that the Kingsbridge Road. Um, I think I heard that road once. You probably have, especially if you know anything about the Bronx. Um, there's Kingsbridge in the Bronx, there's Kingsbridge Road that came up. So yes, so this was this house built in 254 years ago, wow. before the American Revolution. Wow. Um, and it was built by um, a guy named Roger Morris and his wife Mary Phillips. And we're going to look inside. We're going you're going to see all the rooms, and I'm going to talk to you a lot more about them. I just want to point out a few more things. Do you notice these? What are these? Anybody? What are these? You know what these are called? Poles. Okay, poles, but a kind of pole. It has a different name. Anybody have that name? Column. Column. Very good. It's a column. Okay, so this is built to make it look like ancient Rome or ancient Greece. This was a fashion back in 254 years ago that they would make their houses look very fancy and very grand by having these big, tall columns. Okay, so this is, um, this is a colonial style house. So we're going to go inside and then we're going to, um, we're gonna go to a room in the back and if, I don't know, is it okay for people to sit on the... 
when we have a card deck. Is that okay? Okay, so we'll do that, and then we'll talk for a while, and then we'll see the whole house, okay? So um, what I'd like is a chaperone, and that, there are a few rules which I'm sure you already know, which I'm just gonna go over. This is a museum, right? So that means no touching any of the objects. I'm sure you already know that. Just see also, it. Also, mm -hmm. it means no, okay. not even the walls, because even the walls are part of the museum. Um, you can you can ask any questions you want just by raising your hand, and we will talk about whatever you're interested in asking about. Okay, um, and uh, I think we're ready to go inside. Photos okay? I'm sorry. Photos. Photos are fine as long as you don't use a flash. Okay. So. What about me, camera phones? Uh, that's fine as long as there's no flash. Yes, camera yes. phones. And come. You know, just in front of me, wherever you're comfortable. You can sit down on the floor, that's fine. Um, or you can stand, whatever you prefer. We're going to talk for a while. Come closer, because I really want you to hear and, yeah. Come, come, come up to here. That would be great. And again, if you want to sit down, please sit down. Otherwise, um, standing is fine too. So again, welcome. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the man that built this house. Um, so what you're looking at here, there's a special thing about this room. It's a funny shape. It's a different shape than normally. If you look at it, take a minute to look around the room and look at the shape of the room. You can see it has a lot of different angles and the walls are like, there's, it's like there's more than one wall. It's not just square, right? It's not exactly square and it's not exactly round. So if you look around, you could maybe count, see if you can count the walls, and I, I take some guesses about how many walls are in this room, if you count them. How many walls? And that, the, the doorway in the back counts as one wall, so that's one. So see if you can count, and then I'll take some guesses about how many walls this room has. Um, is it like three, I guess, or probably six? Okay, that's a guess. Probably six, yeah. I say about that. Uh, Six also. Okay. So I say twelve. Okay. That's my guess. All right. Yes. From right there, thirteen. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and count with everybody. So we're going to count this first wall. Just allow me, and we'll I'll walk around and show you. Okay. So this one is one. Okay. Then we've got two. Then we've got three. Then we've got four. And then this one actually counts as five. Uh, we've got six, six. we've got seven, seven, this big one, and then we have eight. 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 So this room, is it has eight walls, and it's called the octagon room because it has eight sides. Now, is there some animal that you know of that's got the name oct in it that has eight somethings, swims in the ocean? Octopus. Octopus. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, octopus. So oct means eight so this is an eight walled room and this was special when roger morris i'm going to just ask you not to touch the table at all sorry about that but even it's fine even the t but that's what i mean everything is you know whatever um but uh, again i promise i'll answer you just give me a minute to talk a little bit more okay um so roger morris built this house in a special way first of all he wanted to build a fancy house. He was quite rich, and he wanted to build a fancy house, and he built it on top of this high hill where you could see all around. You could see all the way down to where the ships were coming in in New York Harbor, what is today, uh, what would be today South Street Seaport. And you could see up into the Bronx. You could see all the way over to the Hudson River, and, of course, the Harlem River is right here. So, um, it was a good place to show off that you had a big fancy house, right? So that was one thing. Also, he added this special room which nobody else in all of America had at the time, this room called the Octagon Room. In, if, I don't know if you guys have ever seen something called a gazebo that's outside, you know, it's like a little, Sometimes it has like a, a railing around it's very, um, very pretty sometimes in country towns. I've seen them. You've seen a gazebo. So it's almost like he took the idea of a gazebo. You know how they have many sides like this? 
and he attached it to the house and made it his elegant parlor, his elegant room. So he was the first to do that in all of America, what was then called the colonies. And for the, um, did, have you done any kind of talking at all about the American Revolution or anything having to do with that? When I was in high school, we discussed about the 13 colonies. Okay. The history of the United States. Got you. So there you go. So, so this was the only house of its kind in the 13 colonies in uh, 1765 when it was built. Um, okay, so Roger Morris, um, let me talk a little bit about the American Revolution because it has a lot to do with this house. Roger Morris, I'm going to show you a picture. I'll get back to your question in a minute. Roger Morris and his wife, and we can pass this around. I'm going to show it to you and then we're going to pass it around. So this is Colonel Roger Morris and his wife, Mary Phillips. So Colonel Roger Morris was English, and he married this girl from Westchester, from really what today is Yonkers. And if you know Yonkers, or you've been up there, what's Yonkers Town Hall now is actually, was actually their family Westchester County. County. Westchester uh, County, New York. Correct. She, she and her, her family had a lot of property and a lot of land up there, including uh, what's now Yonkers Town Hall and also a place called Phillipsburg Manor. That's named after Mary Phillips's family. So she was a wealthy woman. Roger Morris was English. He lived here in America. He married her. And actually, she, you know, the way it worked back then, everybody wanted to marry a rich lady because, does, um, because rich ladies were, rich ladies couldn't really own property. If their father had money and they married somebody, let's say they had money because their father had money, the minute they married, the money would go to who? Husband. Their husband. Their husband. So all the more reason for all of these men to want to marry a rich lady because they would get the money from their, fa from their wife's father's estate. So uh, Mary, everybody wanted to marry Phillips. Even George Washington, who knew them, wanted to marry Mary Phillips. But Mary chose Roger Morris. Then Roger Morris built this house for him and his bride, and they were here until 1775. But Roger Morris believed that the British, that is to say the king, should rule over America. But there were some people who did not agree with that, right? And the most famous person who did not want a king ruling over him was who? Became the first president of the United States. Washington. George Washington. Right. And so George Wash. The George, father of our country. The father of our country. Yeah. And George Washington, um, who had not got a chance to marry Mary Phillips, knew them, but, but Roger Moore said, I do not want to fight in this war because I still believe in having a king, so I'm going to leave. And he left this house empty. He and Mary Phillips went back up to her father's place up in um, Phillipsburg, and uh, Roger Morris went back to England and the house was empty. Well, George Washington knew about this house. He had known them. And so he said, oh, house on a hill. I'm going to have a battle. There's going to be fighting. Why is it a good idea? Why is it a good idea to have a house high on a hill if it's going to be your headquarters for a battle, for a war? Why is it smart to be on a hill? What's good about that? You're on a hill and there's going to be fighting. Why do you want to be on a hill and not on down low? What's better about being on a hill? What can you see from the top of a hill that you couldn't see otherwise? Yeah. Um, and go straight down and you can see more things. That's correct. And what are some of the things that you can see? Well, you're, if you're on one side and you have your army on the top of the hill, who can you see coming up to you? Who you do, who you're, who you, who's, well, you're, it's a battle. You got somebody on the, you got. The British. Exactly, the British. The British soldiers. Exactly. So you can see the British soldiers coming. So what a good place for George Washington to decide to be in so that he can, um, he can fight and he can see what's happening and that's exactly what he did. He came here and he took over the house and he had soldiers here. 
He had his officers inside the house, and he had his soldiers in buildings that were outside the house, but right nearby. And so he encamped here for six weeks during what was called the Battle of Harlem Heights. And this was the first battle that George Washington and his army won in New York during the American Revolution. And you know, there are a lot of places where George Washington was, but he was actually here for a long time. For six weeks, that's a long time for any uh, general to be in one place, and that's, this is it. So when we go upstairs, we're going to see the room where George Washington, it was his headquarters where he was in charge of his soldiers. We're going to see that. Okay. So let me talk just a little bit more about the rooms that we're going to see down here. Remember, Roger Morris built this. Um, and, and this room, this special kind of room, um, could have been used uh, during the time that George Washington was here for his, um, his men to gather for his... Um, officers. But uh, this is a pretty fancy room. It, does anybody have any other guesses about what would a room like this be used for? What would people do in a room like this? Um, I'm going to call on you, but let me see if there's somebody else who wants to raise their hand. Is there, there's some other re I mean, look at, take a look. So it's quite fancy. Look at this fancy. This is, right, this is a chandelier with, this, with these uh, candles and these fancy mirrors. And, and this fancy wallpaper. This is set up to look a lot like the way it looked um, about uh, 150, 200 years ago. So, um, so what do you think maybe, what would people have done in this room possibly? Yes, the gentleman in the back, yes. Okay, good, so probably some kind of a living room. Very much like that, right? Very, but a kind of a fancy living room, right? Yeah. Well, uh, Well, I thought in here was parties and swing and dancing. I agree with you, too. Also, dancing. This was also used for parties and dancing. An excellent Dancing point. and recreation for visitors. Exactly. However, this is only reserved for special visitors because some of the visitors that would come here would never even get as far as this room. And so I'm going to take you now into the front of the house we're going to go into a room which is pretty much empty. I'm going to explain what that was used for, and then we're going to see another room also in the front. So I'm going to get to the front, and I'm going to lead you into that room, and then we're going to stand there and talk about that, okay? So follow me. Yeah. That's the front of the house right where we just were. Yes. Right? So, good noticing, because what you see here is, this is the, let's let everybody in, if you guys can come in a little more so that everyone can get in. What you can see is that um, we are in the very first room that you would have gotten into um, in the house. And the way it would work is, first of all, 254 years ago. Um, did they have telephones back no. then? No. no. Did they have cars back then? No. Right. No. Um, so what was the only way to get up here? Let's say you were coming from Wall Street or way downtown. Good. What would be the only way you could have you could have gotten here if if you couldn't if you couldn't ride in a car? Yes. Not Say it again. <laughs> actually, I'm talking about like actual transportation. transportation. Oh, what kind of transportation? Horses. Exactly. So horses, 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 right? So you could either ride a horse or you could have a horse and carriage, right? A carriage pulls the horse. The horses pull the carriage, or you could have walked. So that was it. So it took, uh, by, on horseback, it took about three hours to come up here uh, from downtown, and that was at a very fast gallop. So if you were coming slower, or if you were in a carriage, it was even slower. It took a while. So you could not call somebody and say, hey, uh, can I come over today? No, and that's not how it worked, because there was no phones. So you would come to the door, say you thought, oh, that's a nice house. I'm selling, I don't know, carpets. Let me come and sell a carpet to the lady who has this house. You would knock on the door, knock, 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 and then the maid would come to the door, and then she'd say, well, and the person would say, I'd like to, you know, sell, I want to show the lady of the house my carpets, or my carpet samples, or whatever it was. And, um, and so then, um, that person would be ushered into this room. This is called the French 
parlor. It's the front parlor of the house. And remember how somebody, I believe it was you, who said that um, there was a, it, it was a living room, mini living room, but only for the people who come here. Uh, and they're not really well known by the people who own the house. And they have to have a way to talk to you before they decide if you're going to be allowed to go back into that fancy octagon room. Right? So this is where you meet people before you decide if they're allowed. Now, a lot of people never saw any more than just this room. And um, today, there's no furniture in this room, but it's now being fixed up and um, to look like it did back then. And so I, I think I have a picture. Let me see if I have a picture of it um, that I can pass around. Okay, so you can take this and pass it around. It shows you a little bit of what the room looks like. It had chairs, it had a little table. Um, it actually had a little piano so that you could entertain. But again, it's not as fancy as the room in the back. This is called the French parlor. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, the people who, uh, what happened after George Washington was here, okay? so. George Washington took over this house with his troops. They won the Battle of Harlem Heights, right? However, the British were coming up behind them. The British were, had taken over the rest of New York, and they were coming up behind them. And so when George Washington won the battle, he moved up back into Westchester County. Somebody mentioned Westchester County. He moved back into Westchester County. And guess what happened? The British took over this house. And wow. they then used it as a command center. But for a group of soldiers called the Hessian soldiers, these were mercenaries. Does anyone know what a mercenary is? A mercenary soldier? We actually have them today. Yes, what's a mercenary? Who works for money. Correct. A soldier who works for money. So we had mercenary soldiers here. They were Germans. They were hired by the British. And they were called the Hessian soldiers because they, came, they were um, from an area uh, in Germany ruled over by a family called Hesse. So they were the Hessian soldiers. And when we go into the hallway there, you're going to see a portrait of a famous Hessian general who ruled over the soldiers that were here. The the Hessian soldiers were here until the end of the Revolutionary War. However, the Americans, that is us, we won, ultimately we won the American Revolution and we kicked out the British and the American government took over this house. And then some other interesting things happened. So I'm going to take you into the, uh, into the hallway here. We're going to look at some pictures. And then we're going to see another room on this floor. Yes? Yeah, there's so many rooms. They said once I went to a room and then two pages go. It was a whole wall. The rooms were even beds in the same shape of like this. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that, it is. You know, it might even be from a similar time period in history. All right, we're going to stop here, folks. We're going to talk. Just be careful not to lean on or touch the furniture. Oh, yeah. Let me talk to you about, that's a very, I'm glad you mentioned that. I want to talk about this sofa. Okay. Let me talk about this sofa for a second, okay? You notice the shape of it, right? And that was very fashionable at the time. And let me just say what it's like. Um, let's talk about the way that people dressed back in the old days back then, right? Women wore a very tight um, thing around their, basically around their middle, yeah. that was very tight, called a corset, and then they had big skirts. Well, if you have something very tight like that, it kind of keeps you like this. And so this kind of a couch is easier to get up and down from than if you are sinking into a couch. I guarantee that if you're wearing a corset and a big dress like that, if you sink into a couch, you're not getting up <laughs> without some serious help. Trouble getting up. Exactly, but this is firm so that you can get up and you can uh, put your hand on these. And not not us, but she could have. The lady of the house could have put her hand on the bolster, this circular um, uh, cylinder of a of a pillow, and raised herself up. So it was very good for that kind of 
uh, clothing. So and this is original to the house, this piece. Um, so this is um, General um, Willem von Hesse, who was one of the commanders of the Hessians. He actually wasn't here in the house, but he was in charge of all of the Hessian mercenary soldiers in the American Revolution. Yes. What's his name? Wilhelm, like William. So in German, Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Hesse. So Hesse so from German. Hessian. Wilhelm is the German version of William. William. Wilhelm. So that's him. Uh, and you notice he looks a bit like George Washington because it's a similar style. This was the fashion, the way they had these kinds of coats and they had these kinds of hats. That was the fashion at the time. Um, but uh, that is not Washington, that is Willem von Hesse. I'm going to ask you to turn now and look at the portrait in back, but carefully, again, just not brushing it. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened next in this house. The next thing that happened was that George Washington won the American Revolution, as we know, and when he, when he became president, when George Washington became president, he decided to bring all of his men and uh, their wives back here. The very first, when he was the first president of the United States, the first cabinet of the, of the United States um, with John Adams, um, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Henry Knox, and their wives, they all came back here for a very fancy dinner party. That was in 1790. So that was when we had won the American Revolution and they came back for this dinner party. Now we do not know if it was in the octagon room or outside. It could have been outside like a very, very fancy picnic, but with tables and chairs, <coughs> not sitting on the grass, like a fancy, fancy picnic. Or it could have been inside. So Washington came back here for that, uh, for that fancy dinner, but then he left this house and it was the property of the United States. And the, they, basically what happened, and this happens a lot after wars, the, the winning side sells off the property of the losing side. Okay? And that's what happened in this case. Eventually the house was bought by this woman and her husband. This woman's name is Eliza Jumel. Her husband, Stephen, was a wealthy, a rich uh, wine merchant. He was a person who sold wines, and he was French. And this is a portrait of her with her two grandchildren. Um, and as you can see, it's a little bit, you can see a little, it's quite dark, but you can see how she's wearing that kind of a dress that I was talking about with a tight, what they call bodice, which is the, the sort of middle part, and then this very large skirt. It's certainly not something that's easy to get up and down in. And she's sitting on this fancy chair, and there she is with her grandchildren. Um, Eliza Jamel had very fancy taste in furniture and furnishings. So if you look around, you can see that the wallpaper here is designed to look like marble, like stone. Eliza Jamel, she wanted her, her um, lobby, if you will, her front hall to look like, like an ancient Roman temple something really fancy. And if you look toward the octagon room, you can see there are clouds on the wallpaper. She wanted her guests to feel that they were looking from a temple into heaven. That's how she wanted them to feel when they came into this house. And these golden wings that are up near the ceiling, you see the golden wings, and they have a quiver full of arrows, you see that? Those were given to Madame Eliza Jamel and her husband Stephen, we think possibly by Napoleon, who was the ruler of France at the time of, during part of the time that Eliza Jamel uh, was here. And she traveled a lot back and forth to France, and we know that these are French. We know that they are, that's really gold paint, but made out of gold. Not just gold colored, but made out of gold. And uh, it's painted on wood, and that, and it's very, it is possible that it was actually from, uh, from Napoleon to her. She was a big fan of Napoleon. Um, we are going to also, before we go upstairs, we're going to take a look at the dining room. Uh, the dining room, I also want you to take a look around and notice some things. I want you to look 
at the lamps. See if you can notice anything about the light, how the, how the lamps are in that room or the lights. And I also want you to look at the wallpaper and see what you think and then we'll talk about it once you see. So why don't we just kind of, let's let people take a look in. You know, you can't go all the way in, but you can look and we'll circle around and maybe you can lead them, the chaperones can lead people around so that everybody gets a chance to really take a look. So maybe four or five people at a time and then we can um, take a look. And I want you to notice things and then we're going to ask you what you thought, what you saw. And I always forgot to tell you about this couch. Uh -huh. is, is this the yellow stripey has made with silk fabric? It is. It's a silk, yeah, it's a yellow striped silk, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? It looks beautiful. Now this one is the dining room, is in 1825. Right here, you can see there's a fireplace zone. Nice. Right next to it, there's a clock and there's the that's the chandelier in the fireplace. There's the crystal on it, on, on the ceiling. Yeah, that's the chandelier. That has diamonds, you know, like, it's just changes around. That's some four windows. Four windows? Wow. Rectangular size. Oh, no, I see there's four teapots. There's a vase, and then... And every, there's a couple of curtains. You can equally use it where you can, just in case you can. And that's the dining room, 1825. Because we, you ask a lot of questions, I promise I will get to you, but let's see if there's other hands. Anybody else notice anything there about, what about? And those are four windows. Yes. And there's a wall. Yes. Shaped by ice cream cones. Yes, isn't that odd? It's yeah. very strange. See? Yes, excellent. Okay, so good. Great noticing. Let me let me uh, six chairs. Yes. Six chairs in the back of the window. Mm-hmm. And the cabinet to keep all your personal drawings and your papers. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, so let me talk about a few things he mentioned, okay? First of all, uh, this very strange wallpaper that looks like ice cream cones, right? It really looks quite modern. It doesn't really look like something from way back, but it is exactly the wallpaper that Eliza Jamal ordered. We know the wallpaper that Eliza Jamal ordered because she wrote letters to her husband in France. She was in America, and she was writing to him in France saying, get me this wallpaper. And she described exactly what she wanted, so this is exactly the wallpaper style that she wanted. So we know this is really like what she would have had here. So that's an interesting thing. That something, sometimes something looks modern, but they really did have that fashion back then. I want to talk about the windows, because I didn't talk about it enough when I was in the Octagon room too. Remember, okay, we said that there were no cars and there were no phones. Okay, but let's also think back a little bit on what else they did not have back then. Back then, right, they didn't have cars, they didn't have phones. How about um, heating and cooling? What, what do we have today that they didn't have then? What, what did they have? Uh, air conditioning and, uh, and some heating. Exactly. Heating yeah. surfaces. So, exactly. So what's the only way to heat a room if you don't have heating? Use coal. Okay, but you have to have a stove for coal. Use stove. What did, the, what did these rooms have that you could heat a room with? What do they have? A fireplace. 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 Oh, you right up there and fireplace. I could do that. Um, but, but, Cut it and put it in the fire. Exactly. So fireplace. So guess what? They had no electricity. No electricity. No electricity at all. So they couldn't have air conditioning. They couldn't have heating the way we think of heating. But they could heat using fireplaces. And they needed windows. And they needed doors for air to come through. When they first built this house, it was a summer home. 
and so they needed air to flow through. And if you notice, I'm just going to stay where you are, but I'm going to show you this. This is one door. This is the side door out. This is a side door to the outside. And so you could have opened these doors and had air coming this way and that way. If you'd open that door or the windows, you would have air flowing throughout this, and it would be cooling down this otherwise very hot house. So they can afford when they go to say yes. We without air, we air the breeze. You sure do. And it, it could have gotten very hot in here, but they were able to open all of these windows. And also, if you have no electricity, how do you light your house? If you can't, if you can't um, light it with a light bulb because you don't have electricity, what do you use to make light inside of the house? Yes. What was it? Candles. Exactly. Candles. Exactly right. So you have candles. And I don't know if you noticed how there are these, all these mirrors in the octagon room. The mirrors reflect light. So it made the room lighter because you couldn't turn up. However, by the time the Jamels were here, they had something a little bit more than candles. The lamps on either side of that, um, that fireplace there, they, they look like this, like a vase. Do you see those? You, did you guys see those? Yes. Those yeah, lamps, we see the vase. They have a wick and oil, and you could actually light the wick and then raise and lower it, so it was like having a dimmer switch. But it was, it was like a candle, but you could actually make it dimmer or brighter. That was a big change. When the house was built, they didn't have that technology yet. They didn't have, they didn't know how to do that yet. They only had candles. And they didn't yes. have electricity, electric lights and so forth. Exactly. They used candles, so it was fairly hot. How yes. about if yes. we could use the lantern? Yes. Or lantern. Lanterns were used mostly outside, um, usually, and you know, the way it was is that, for instance, let's say you were reading in your room. You know, we think you can stay up till 11, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning because you can turn on your light or turn off your light. Well, they couldn't do that. All you had was a candle, um, you know, before they had this ra raising and lowering of the wicks even. So people really would read until the light went away, you know. And, you, you know, depending on how rich or poor you are, you might have a candle or many candles, or you might not have that many candles. So, you know, when it gets dark, that's the end of your reading time. So it was a very different life than it is today. So I'm gonna, we're going to go up to the second floor, and we're going to see a bunch more rooms, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what happened after Eliza and her husband, Stephen, bought and started to decorate the house. It's a big, big house. Nice place to live, huh? Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> I like this house. Yeah, it's beautiful. And th there's no furniture right now in this room, but there will be soon. They've taken it out to fix it up, but it's going to be really beautiful when it comes back. They just put up this new wallpaper, which is beautiful. I'm going to see if everybody's following. This way, please, everyone, come into this room. This way, in here. Um, you see in some of the places uh, there were doorways between bedrooms belonging to a husband and wife. This one, uh, in this case, Eliza was here and this was her own room. Also, you might have a room, you might share some time with your husband or wife and then you would still have your own room for your own things, to dress, to get ready, things like that. So when, if you would come back here, let's just say in about a year, you'll see their, her bed will be back. It's a very elegant bed, and uh, there'll be carpet on the floor, um, and there'll be furniture here that is being taken out and being um, fixed up uh, to make sure that we have it looking exactly like Eliza Jamel would have had it. But the furniture itself that will be back in this room actually did belong to Eliza Jamel. I want to talk for a minute about Eliza because I think she's 
probably the most interesting person who ever lived in this house, even though George Washington is so wonderful and all the other people, but I have to talk about Eliza a little bit. So let me tell you about her. She started her life very, very poor. She lived in Providence, Rhode Island, which is maybe about, I don't know, four or five hours from here. Um, today, by car, but back then it was probably a month, days away. And she grew up, her mother was a prostitute, and she didn't know who her father was. She grew up um, in a very poor household, and um, she was, her family was basically chased out of town by the townspeople because they didn't like what her mother was doing. And uh, they didn't like her, and so she spent a lot of her time um, in a place called, what they call it, like a debtor's prison or a poorhouse, where people were sent who didn't have any money and didn't, weren't able to take care of themselves um, because of their poverty. It was a bad system, and this is, we're talking about in the early, uh, the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. This poor girl was so smart that by the time she came to New York, she got a job as a very minor actress on the stage, like an extra, you know, like a, a small part. She could speak and write and read in English and French. She became completely literate in French and English. She was seen on the stage by this rich wine merchant, and I'm gonna tell you a story, which we do not know if it's 100% true, but it might be true. <clears throat> but I love the story, so I'm going to tell it to you. Eliza had a relationship. This we know for a fact. She had this four-year affair or relationship with this man, Stephen Jamel. But, you know, she was his lover, his girlfriend. But she wasn't married to him. Well, the story goes like this. One day she says, oh, I'm not feeling well. I'm sick. And she, she, she looks pale and she gets... She seems like she's sicker and sicker and sicker. She takes to her bed, she lies down, she says she's not feeling well, and she's in her bed for weeks, and she's saying how terrible she feels, and she's telling the doctor that she's gonna die, and they don't know what's wrong with her, and there's nothing they can do, and they, you know, and she's basically wasting away in her bed, and she says, and then, you know, and when everybody's sure she's gonna die, she says to Stephen, Stephen, I'm about to die, would you make an honest woman of me? And what that meant was, will you marry me so that I can die a married woman and not a woman who's having an affair, but a woman who has a relationship that is legal? Can, will you marry me before I die? And so he says, of course, you poor, uh, of course, Eliza, I'll marry you. So he marries her. And the next morning, she wakes up. She's totally fine. She gets out of bed. Now she's Mrs. Eliza Jumna. So the story is, that's how she got her husband, her, her boyfriend at the time, to marry her. Why? Right. <laughs> Pretty smart, huh? Pretty smart. Yes. So that would have been probably in about uh, sometime around 18, around 1800, 18, 1805, something like that. Yeah. Yes. I call that right and smart. Right and smart. I agree. Very right and smart. Brilliant. So, okay, so let's apply to Jamel. Say again? Say again. The honest love story. A lot of really honest love story, but really very, very smart, Eliza. Okay, so Eliza Jamel, not only did she marry Stephen, but she was very happily married to him for a long time, married for 18 years. And <clears throat> what happened was, Stephen was a, a wine merchant and a seller of things and spent a lot of time in France. He spent time in France. She came back to New York. And what happened was the interesting next part is that he didn't do as well in business as he was, we, we would have thought he would have done. He wasn't doing so well. Eliza came back here to New York and she got a very special relationship set up legally. She got set up so that she could be the boss of the company here in New York. Now this was very unusual because women didn't have the right to do business under their own name, but she set up a legal arrangement with her husband because he was in France 
and she got the right to do business under the name of Jamel. So that was very smart. So what did she do? She started to buy and sell New York real estate and she made a fortune and became the richest woman in New York. And her husband, who hadn't done very well in his business in France, when he came back, he had to depend on his wife, Eliza, to give him money because she had made so much money and he didn't have any money anymore. She became so smart because she was such a good businesswoman. So that's another reason to admire how smart Eliza Jamel was. And she did one other uh, very important thing. She set up what's called a life trust so that she would get a, a salary from the estate for the rest of her life, like a chunk of money every um, year for the rest of her life. And she set that up so it couldn't be changed. And she also took some of the family property and put it in the name of her daughter so that if there were creditors or people who wanted money, they couldn't take it because it was in her daughter's name. Super, super smart. She was like, she's a very smart, honestly. Well, <laughs> yes, she was and smart. Some story. Real That's story. Story. Yeah. Really a remarkable person. I'm going to get to your promise. Um, so, we're going to see the bedroom of Eliza's second husband. Eventually, Stephen Jamel died, and, and Eliza Jamel married a very famous person whose name was Aaron Burr. Now, I don't know if any of you know who Aaron Burr was. I know Aaron Burr. I think I know Aaron Burr. Very good. Aaron. Vice President and? He's the enemy of Alexander Hamilton. That's correct. He killed Alexander Hamilton in the duel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And he shot him. That's correct. Why did they do that for? Okay, so let, that's a very good question. Let me ask you that. First of all, does everyone know what a duel is? Uh, two guys. Two guys? Yeah, two guys with, uh, uh, guns. with uh, guns and then they're pointing at uh, each other. And, they, they and see who, who will beat the winner. Perfect. That's per perfect. Correct. Uh, how tall was that Alexander Hamilton? How tall was he? Was he? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, go ahead. Five seven. Uh, five? They were both five seven. Both five seven. Right. Thank you. Seven. Ninety seven twelve. Okay. Yes. Question. Question. Even so, how come? How? How come that the same things instead of standing over here? Oh, because he had a lot of business to conduct, because he was, he was doing his business, but his business didn't turn out so good. And she was tired of being in France. She wanted to go back to New York. She loved New York. So that's why she came and he stayed there. Let me talk a little bit about the duel in Alexander Hamilton, okay? Because you guys are asking that question. So why did they fight? Well, um, they actually fought together in the American Revolution. They knew each other. They even been lawyers together defending the same client. They actually had worked together. So why did they fight? Well, Alexander Hamilton and, and Aaron Burr disagreed in some politics. So it's not that different from the way things are today. They disagreed in politics. And um, Alexander Hamilton said some things about uh, Aaron Burr that got into the press. And they were insulting each other back and forth in the press. It got very nasty. And um, that's when they were ch challenging each other to a duel. In the, let me just say one more thing. Um, there were many opportunities in, in the duel to stop it. In other words, there are, the way the whole duel thing used to work, there were many times when you could negotiate and stop the fighting. Well, they kept on going and kept on going. And even though everybody knew it was stupid, and Alexander Hamilton's son had son had died in the duel, one of his sons, he had many sons, but one of his sons died in the duel, they still insisted, and Alexander Hamilton um, did not actually point his gun and shoot at Aaron Burr, he shot into the air, um, which was a common thing to do, but he, right before he did that, he made some motions like testing out his gun and checking it out, like aiming it, so 
he gave Aaron Burr every reason to think he was really going to fire, but then he didn't fire, but then Aaron Burr fired and Aaron Burr hit him. By the way, those guns were not very good guns. They didn't really work very well. So you, it's possible to fire and not hit anyone, because those were really, really old-fashioned guns, like not at all like today. Um, and so he actually did hit Alexander Hamilton in the body, and, and then Alexander Hamilton was taken by the doctor, but he died uh, the next night. Um, and so, but that happened when they were young men. Um, Aaron Burr lived to be an old man. He married Eliza Jamel when he was already in his 80s. Yeah. And she was, um, she was uh, considered, she was in her 50s. So he married a younger woman. And he married her probably because by that time she was a very rich woman. And he, she married him because she thought, you know, the fact he was the vice president of the United States. I, you know, he was a, a he had um, a good uh, family, came from a good family. It will make me um, uh, be more accepted by all the rich people in New York. The rich people in New York did not really accept Eliza Jamel ever. They sort of thought she's not one of us, even though she had all this money. Money wasn't enough. They did not really ever accept her, and she always wanted to be accepted by them. And she thought by marrying Burr, Aaron Burr, that maybe that would work, but it didn't work. Anyway, Aaron Burr decided he would hit the jackpot, he was going to spend all, all her money, he was going to do all this business and all this, and he started to spend her money as fast as he could. Now, the thing is, remember, Eliza had set it up so that he couldn't just spend money, he had to ask her for money, and he did, and she gave it to him, but eventually she saw that he was really not taking care of money and she did not like it. So she divorced him. She divorced him, they were married for uh, less than two years. She divorced him and, this is an amazing thing, another really amazing thing about Eliza Jamel, she hired for her divorce lawyer another son of Alexander Hamilton. So what if Alexander? Also a little mean, because of course, Alexander Hamilton's death had also da damaged Aaron Burr's reputation. Aaron Burr never was respected and liked after that very much. And so she knew that that was the last person he would want to see was anybody having to do with Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton. But she hired Alexander Hamilton's son for her divorce lawyer, and the divorce was granted, and so she was free of Aaron Burr. And actually, he died on the same day that the divorce was granted. He was an old man. He was living in Staten Island at the time, and he died um, on that same day that she got her divorce. Yeah? What, what did I get divorced for? Or did... We have to have a reason, right? In divorce, you have to have a reason. And she said he was unfaithful to her. Yeah. Now, whether she, he was or not, we don't really know. It's possible because, you know, he's quite a ladies' man. But that's what she said. Yeah. And she, why did she really divorce him? Probably because he wasn't taking, he was try, spend, trying to spend all the money and she was not having it. He wasn't taking care of business. She just married her for her money. Exactly. Exactly. And she found that that's out. That's the whole story, James. I, I think that's you the whole story. You married a woman, married not for her money, but share wealth and responsibility. That's what a marriage is for, an equal partnership. I agree. And if that was not an equal partnership for sure. It was meant to be, but it didn't turn out that way. So the next room we're going to see is, at, is Aaron Burr's bedroom, where he stayed and lived when he was married to Eliza Jamel. So I'm going to skirt around here. I'm going to take you into that room. We're not going to go inside, but you're going to rotate in and take a look, OK? This is the Aaron Burr's bed chamber. This is Aaron's bed. That's a stripy chair that Ashley, that he puts all the way to the pillows, like the straws. The second one. But it was right here on this curtains, cover it, and then the high pin place for this bedroom. Very interested in the, in the things that are here on the wall, and this is the baseball exhibit. I do not want to deprive you of the baseball exhibit. I'm going to talk to you about the Aaron, Aaron Burr bedroom, then we're going to talk a little bit about the baseball exhibit, and then we're going to go back to looking at the house. 
I, I, because this is such an interesting um, exhibit and I know a lot of you would like it, I want to not skip it. But we can't spend a lot of time here. You can come back and look at it anytime on your own if you want to. Um, but I'm going to ask everybody to come back to this hall and then we're going to talk about the Arenberg bedroom and then I'm going to let you, we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to someone who's going to talk a little bit about the baseball exhibit and then we're going to continue our tour of the house. Okay. Can I start? Yes. It's really interesting about Amber's. You can see, I can see the four curtains in the bedrooms. Yes. Right. Um, so, you know, it's quite elegant. There's that four poster bed. There's the curtains. Um, there's the dresser. Um, and um, but also there's that striped chair. Why is that striped chair important? Well, it's, it's really important just because has anybody heard of the musical Hamilton? Yes. yes. So Hamilton, the musical, was written, part of it was written here in that room. Lynn Manuel, yes. Lynn Manuel Miranda is a local person from Washington Heights and he knew about this house and um, uh, the woman who was the director of this house at the time, she invited him when she heard from him that he was writing a musical about Alexander Hamilton. She said, why don't you come here and write in the Aaron Burr bedroom? And he did. And if you watch, there's a PBS documentary about the making of Hamilton. You will see Lynn manuel sitting in that chair with his laptop writing. And he wrote the songs about Aaron Burr he wrote in that bedroom. Also, they won for the Tony Awards. They won a ton of Tony Awards. Yes, they did. That's all the musical history. It's a fantastic musical, by the way. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's the most remarkable thing. Now, we are going to interrupt our historical tour for of uh, the mansion to talk a little bit about baseball history and why this, and maybe you could tell them a little bit, and I'm going to stop you if you start going on and on, because I know you want to talk a lot about it, but I want you to tell them a little bit about why it's important to have a history of baseball exhibit exactly here at this mansion, why it's here, and maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, that whole aspect of this show, okay? okay so this so is Neil. Hey, Neil. Hi, how is everybody doing? Uh, I'm an attorney, art dealer, and sports enthusiast, and the, and the museum asked me to curate this show about the polo grounds, and you're right, the polo grounds is important. Uh, for this particular museum, in a sense, because right across the street, basically, was the Polo Grounds. Uh -huh. And the Polo Grounds that, that not only housed the New York, uh, New York Giants, which most people think of, it housed five teams. The New York Yankees played here from 1913 to 1922. Wow, I didn't yeah. know so that. So you didn't know that. Uh, Babe Ruth actually played his first game as a Yankee in the Polo Grounds. And Babe Ruth hit his first home run at the Polo Grounds as a Boston uh, uh, Red Sox. Uh -huh. Documentary special about baseball. Right. So and Burns. That's right. That's right. And and, and, and uh, we hope Mr. Burns comes here actually. But anyway, so we also the um, New York Giant football team played here from 1925 <laughs> to 1955. They actually won three NFL championships. And so, and also the New York Jets, who were originally called the New York Titans, played here from 60 to 64. And the New York Mets played here from 62 to 63. So although Evans Fields gets a lot of credit. And for Brooklyn, and it should, the boys of summer, the public grounds, in my judgment, is actually even more important because almost every New York team that we all love started or played there one time or another. So these are all these tributes are pieces that I do, and what makes them a little bit extraordinary is generally when you think of memorabilia, you think of a single autograph or a single ticket, which is great. I try to join no, multiple items together, in a sense, making a story. I'll just show you one piece now. And then when you guys come back later, I'll be having to give you a full tour. tour. I'm going to start off with my father's hero, Mickey Mantle. And one of his great uh, accomplishments was 18 home runs of World Series play, which is still the record. We have the ticket from every World Series game Mantle hit a home run in, and underneath it is the autograph of the pitchers he hit the home runs off. So again, we try to tell the stories of that moment. So enjoy the rest of your tour and come back. I'll be here until 5 o'clock, or at least 4.30. And the most important news today is that Wisconsin's beating Michigan 35 to 8. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. I know it's so honestly. Okay, so let's, um, we're going to see George Washington's forum. 
Um, I also want to point out this room. So this room was one of the bedrooms of one of the children. Um, the, when the, the Morrises were here, it was the Morris children, but this is uh, um, set up to be um, what the room would have been like uh, for Eliza Jamel's grandson, um, William Chase. So take a look, come on in, take a look and see it's a boy's room. And I also want you to notice the kinds of things that are in that room that would indicate that it was a kind of a school room. In other words, a place where somebody would study and would learn and would have their lessons. So when you are coming out of this room after you see it, I want to hear from you what you think would have been used as a school room or as a teaching tool, something they would have had to learn from when they, um, when, when uh, William Chase was there. That room I saw should be a library. And also Williams that I see the desktop. Okay, wait, wait until everyone comes out because I want to get from everyone and then we'll see. Yeah. As a, uh, something that, you know, like a boy would have been studying. No books. No books, excellent. Yes. No books, very, very good. No books for sure. What else? What else would, um... The map of the world. Very good. Now, a map. But it is a special kind of map. What's that called? Yes? The globe. Excellent. So map, globe. Yes. We would have studied geography using the globe. Excellent. Sure. Absolutely. About the history of the United States. Yes. So remember back in those days, mostly, um, you know, the, the fashion was for only boys to get educated. But I'm, even Eliza Jamel, I think she would have educated her girl, uh, uh, her granddaughter, at least a little bit until she got married. But it was popular really for the boys to get an education. Girls had a different kind of education of learning how to keep a home, um, and mostly boys were the ones who were going to school. Uh, yeah, no, no flash, just no flash. No flash just, all the pictures are fine, but not flash. Slowly. So next we're going to do for the George Washington after William Bard or William Bard for, for boys school of room. And to see when we, when we get to the line and then we're going to see for the George Washington. This is the Washington's wall room and we can tell you about George Washington just lives into this. He was on August 27, 1776. Now you can mace by this is tents, with this desktop, with a uh, what do you point to? There's the drawers or my copy mic on those next windows. There's the five places and I tell you before I, and there's a statue, it's kind of glass, Washington DC. Probably like in bowls in here. Or kind of draws everything together for it. That's a Washington's wall. We're heading downstairs. Yes, that's where you feel comfortable. Can anybody sit down, Carl? Yep. Okay, good. Yep, have a seat. Great. Um, okay. So, I guess we got a couple more coming down, right? Oh, I just had to wait. Okay. okay. So, this is the, called the Colonial Kitchen. And um, I want to ask you guys what you think why is this called a kitchen? Why is it a kitchen? I don't see any... That, that we use, that we, that has to cook every, every day and night for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh-huh. And what do they use to cook? Where, where, where's the cooking happening? Um, I see what's pots. Good. Frying pans. Okay, you see the frying pans. Where do they, what is the pans. Where, where do they, where does that happen? Okay, you got Oh, and also I saw the kettle. Okay, right. Okay, so I'm going to show you something. That's the tea kettle on the left. Right, now why is this on this kind of metal arm here? What's what's going on here? How 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 do you how do you boil the water? How do you 
cook the food. What do you, what do you cook it over? <coughs> yeah, I use the fire for the fireplace. Exactly. Heat it. Use the fire in the fireplace. So, this is the stove. Back in the colonial days in 1765 when this house was built, this is how they cooked. They didn't have a stove. They had a fireplace. They, they had cooked. regular ovens. That's what right. they well, invented. Ah, uh, now, but that's a very interesting point because they didn't have an oven the way we think of. But actually, there is a kind of an oven here. You see this? Oh, that's... And there's a hole in there, and there's a cover here. What kind... It is an, a kind of an oven. Um, it, yeah, we, oh, no. that, well, there is something we cook today in ovens like that, that uh, lots of people go out and eat that kind of food that goes into an oven like that. Any, any ideas for what we cook today in an oven like that? It has a microwave oven. Okay, but this is like a, just like this. You can you put something. You put it on a flat thing and you put it in there and cook it and then you take it out, cut it up into slices. Anybody? Exactly. It is a pizza, like a pizza oven. Now back in those days, 1765, they didn't have pizza because they didn't know about pizza. They didn't have um, Italian immigrants coming, so they didn't know about pizza. But they would cook bread. And cakes. Bread, rolls, cakes. Well, those, they would cook those in this oven. They would put bread. hot coals in there. And bread. Bread. They would put hot coals in there and put their bread in and cook it in that oven. So they had a kind of oven. And then they would cook the rest of the food um, on the fire. And as you can see, these pots and pans, well, they have these legs. And so that's a way to put hot coals underneath and cook your food above. So that's how it's done. Yes, so they would stand. Exactly. It's good. And um, somebody mentioned something um, earlier. They talked a little bit about what about um, for light. What about a um, a lantern? Well, this is a lantern, but this wouldn't have been used down here as much as it would have been used outside. You put your candle in here. It has little holes cut in it, and then you can have the light shining out of it, um, and you can carry it. Usually, it had a strap that you could carry. And you would use it maybe to check on your cows to make sure that they were milked or go out there in the early morning when it was still dark. You would use a, a candle like that. Also, here we have a replica of something. So poor ch poorer children would make dolls out of, does anybody want to guess what this is made out of? What is this? They have um, bleach. Oh, man. Twigs. Twigs? Here, touch that. Paper. See if you can figure out what this is. What is this? I don't know. It's dried and it comes from a plant. All those leaves? Dried leaves. Dried yes. leaves. Dried okay. Leaves. But a specific kind of plant that is actually used for food. Any, any guesses? Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about a, a couple of other things that are really important about what was uh, interesting about this kitchen. So first of all, the people who lived upstairs, probably most of them never ever came down here. Who worked down here? Who would have worked down here? Well, the servants would have worked here. And in 1765, New York, New York still had slavery and there were slaves that were working in this house who were um, uh, working for uh, the Morrises, for um, Roger and Mary. More yes. servants. And then after they left, the Jamels were here, but the Jamels did not have slaves. They did have servants. And there was a kind of servant called an indentured servant. And that's important to know what that is. Okay? A lot of people came here, very, very poor, and even sometimes children would be sold into this kind of a slavery called indenture. And what it meant is that they would be sold for like a term of years, like 20 years. They would have to work for 20 years for this family and they would get fed and they would get some place to sleep and they would learn a trade, like maybe they would learn how to cook or they would learn how to take care of gardens or whatever it was. And then after those 20 years or 12 years, whatever it was, then they would be, they would be freed and they would have learned something and maybe they could go and work for a regular salary. But many people, were uh, indentured servants. So many ancestors were indentured servants. 
Um, and, and like I said, there was slavery, and then slavery, it took a while for, before slavery ended in New York State, but the Jamels were anti-slavery, did not believe in slavery. And so they did not have slaves, but the Morrises did have slaves. We know they had at least three slaves. Um, so, but yeah. living down here, uh, there was a much bigger area, because the wall that you're in front of wasn't here. This whole area, you know how big it is upstairs? Well, it's equally big down here. It's actually, if you broke down all the walls that are up here now, it would be as big as it is upstairs. And there was an area for sleeping, and there was an area for washing, and this would have been the area for cooking. Um, and another thing that's important to know is that here there are some floorboards. It's not like anywhere else. It's covered with wood. And the reason is that down below here, there is a well. And so this is a very unusual house because you could actually bring water directly up from the well using the bucket and having it go down into the well and pulling it up from here so that you wouldn't have to go because otherwise servants would have had to go on where to get water. Where would they have got to go uh, to get water? We know we're surrounded by what? To the fountain. Well, there weren't any though. Well, we had to find river to get water. Exactly, you'd have to go all the way down to either the, the Harlem River or the Hudson uh, River. And that's a long way to carry water. Yes. If you've ever tried to carry some bottles of water. Almost like really heavy one. Um, so the fact that they could um, pull water right into the house was a luxury. Hmm. And even for servants, it made life better than having to carry water all of that way. So even though life was very hard for servants and slaves, they did have some things that made it a little bit less hard. And by the way, this floor, you see how it's brick? It would have been dirt. So it was not brick at the time, it was dirt. But this stone is original. This was stone, like a stone fireplace um, here, and then and, and the stone on the floor here, and then this would have been a dirt floor. Um, there's a couple of other things down here that are just important to, to kind of know about. Um, and that is, I want to show you something. Well, let me show you a couple of things, and you're going to tell me what you think they were used for. OK, this is the most fun one. Let's see if you can guess. Now, I do this with a lot of school groups that I have, and a lot of, sometimes they guess and sometimes they don't. Now, I'm going to tell you first, I'm going to give you some hints. I'm going to tell you, this is something that goes over the fire, okay? Now, it has this. So, something gets put in here to cook. What, anybody have a guess about what this is used, what gets put in here? The toaster. Exactly, it is a toaster. It is a 19th right. century toaster. Right. That's what toaster you can see it spins around. It spins around. You can get both sides toasted. Very good. Okay, excellent. So um, I will show you another thing, and you can tell me, and I think you're going to be able to guess this one because you probably had this for breakfast. Maybe some of you have. I certainly have a few times. Um, so what do you think this is? A waffle iron. The main paint waffle iron. A waffle iron. Yes. A waffle iron. So you hold it over. You, you hold it over the fire. And like, you make your waffles. Okay, like, so. We like waffles for breakfast. Oh, is that right? My goodness, well, how perfect. Um, okay, so you, you can see that that some of the things that we have today, um, they have them. Um, okay, so that, but there's there's a special thing I really want to show you that is down here. Now, I will tell you that this is not something that has to do with cooking. I'm going to let every single one of the people who are sitting here uh, hold this. And then I'm going to ask you what you think it is. Yes. So we're going to pass it around very carefully. I'm going to help you. Um, and so this, about, about uh, 19 of these were found all around the grounds here. So I'm going to start with you. And you're going to hold your hands like together like that. And I'm going to hold your hands together like that. And I'm going to put, OK, you so you can cannonball. But it is a special kind of cannonball called a shot. And it comes from a very smaller cannon than usual. Um, but it's a pretty deadly weapon. If you think about this, you know, with the gunpowder and then it goes shooting, right. you know, it can break down a wall, can obviously damage a person, uh, if not kill them. Uh, it is a very heavy object to be flying through the air and hitting something. So this is a, this is a uh, Revolutionary War shot cannonball from, yep, 
from 1776, and they were all found around here, so they're all from the Revolutionary War, and this is an yeah, actual one. Yeah. Absolutely, they were dangerous weapons, yeah. sure. Yeah. What about these plates? So these plates just represent plates that they would have had, so this is a, a metal called pewter, so a lot of the, the plates are made out of metal rather than china. Um, probably upstairs they would have had some fancy china for the ladies and gentlemen upstairs. It but came with a stainless steel. There was no stainless steel, steel back then. Pre, pre, stainless before stainless steel. 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 Not, a, not been invented yet, Carl. That's correct. So, um, but this, uh, this, metal. this would have been um, before stainless steel. Um, and it's it was metal. used for a lot of things. It's called pewter. Um, and uh, it's quite light, actually. Mm. We could pass that around. You can see it's quite light. It's the opposite of what we're just uh, touching. It's it's very light, but it's not uh, ceramic. It's metal, and um, that was used for many many common things like drink for uh, for mugs and and various things right. like that. Um, right. Why? Why? for coffee cups. It's much lighter. Yeah, it's light. Yeah, much lighter. Mm -hmm. Not heavy. Not heavy at all. Yeah. So that's beautiful. So you hold your hands. Well, yeah, um, but I, I think upstairs they would have had. They would have had, um, uh, yeah, so this is this common metal. So you would have had it for, um, like, if you were, um, you know, having uh, more casual food, uh, maybe not in a very fancy dinner party. You would have just had this for everyday use. But uh, I'm sure they used China upstairs. Um, okay, so that really concludes um, pretty much everything. Uh, let me show you just two more things. Two more things. Two more things. Let me, uh, okay. First of all, oh, this is, okay. Anybody want to guess what this was used for? Now remember, upstairs, we talked a little, well, okay, I won't give a hint yet. I'm going to ask, just ask. What do you think this was used for? It's like a... It's to make something. Okay, it doesn't candles. have those. Can we make candles? Okay. Oh, yeah. You can that, yeah. It can be candles? Uh-huh. Uh, it is candles. It is to be used to make candles. Remember, they needed a lot of candles. So they would pour the wax in, put the wick in, and pour it, pour the wax in, and then be able to pull out the candles. It so fills in, it's like a pan pipe. Yeah. Uh, that's true, but it is in fact pan. And of course, and what's this? Iron. Right, so you heat it up in the iron. stove, and you iron, right? Oh, yes. Yes. No electricity, but you can iron your clothes. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to worry Making sure the clothes will be dry. Say so again? You don't have to worry about your child leaving the eye and all. Exactly. That's right. Maybe things were better back then in some ways. Uh, but in other ways, it was much harder because you had to scrub your clothes by hand. You had to cook over a fire. You couldn't regulate the fire the way you can today. You know, there were in, in some, you know what? Cooking, cleaning, and all that took a lot longer back then than it does like, today. Like so, this eye where we do for the laundry. Yes. It was much. It was a much more labor-intensive yes. process than it is today. So um, that's really pretty much it. Um, and um, if you have any more questions, I think we should go upstairs where your uh, colleague is who couldn't come downstairs. And let's conclude the tour upstairs. Okay. And I'm gonna. Um, yeah. Come on, everybody. Let's just come in a little bit more so here in the circle here. So, I'll we'll wait until everybody's back. I'm sorry? There's a men's room downstairs and a women's room. That's fine. Men's room is downstairs, the women's room is upstairs. We have everybody in the back who's. Um, how, do we have any other people besides the two that went? Are, am I still waiting for some people? I think there's a couple people who are still coming up from downstairs. That's my okay. How many more? We oh, have just okay. one in the bathroom. Okay, fine. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to say thank you so much for allowing me to give you this tour. I'm happy to answer any more questions that you have. I hope that this also makes you think a lot more about American history and how it's really real and really here, right under our feet every day, 
There's so much history. What happened actually right here in New York City and right here. Yeah. Well, I saw how this nice actual thing you should do, put it in the histories. Put it in the hist history books. You okay, know, history books. Oh. Uh huh. Uh, history stations and the TV. Thank you. You know, I don't know, but there might have been something done on there. I'm not sure. They sometimes do ghost hunts here. There is this idea that maybe Eliza Jamel is still around here as a ghost. Um, I don't know. I can't confirm or I neither confirm nor deny that. Um, it may or may not be true. You, they actually have these ghost hunts here, and they're really fun. So if you have a chance, you can come back for one of those. Um, but um, yes, uh, there's a lot of amazing history in Manhattan's oldest house. So um, I also want to just urge you to, if you if you can, to if you can't. I get a chance to spend more time in the house today that you can come back um, and, uh, and, and learn more. There's just so much about New York City history and about the Revolutionary War right here in, um, in Washington Heights. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.